we have the <clears throat> opportunity to explore what circling may be. Uh, thank you to <coughs> the facilitators. Uh, thank you also, Peter. Uh, <coughs> no, I haven't talked to you about it yet, but thank you to all the facilitators for <coughs> making time for this talk. I appreciate it. Uh, I've been asked many times during the past several days uh, about the contents of this talk. And so this seems like a good opportunity to give it, although I didn't myself expect to do it today. Uh, I appreciate the invitation, the opportunity to share uh, this uh, perspective. And I should say <clears throat> about that, that this talk, uh, as you may tell from the format, is not spoken from my perspective. Uh, it is my job, in any case, to speak it from the context of an ancient tradition uh, that conveys truth, not merely opinions, not merely uh, personal views. And uh, that tradition has been formulated by many people uh, who, like us here, like all of you, disagreed with each other. And uh, the point that is not disagreed about is uh, the point of that tradition the one thing that none of us disagree about, that all of us agree on. Uh, thousands of years of thousands of the most brilliant, caring, compassionate, wise people in all of history, uh, that thousands of years of work uh, have resulted in something that is uh, profound and should be exalted and uh, this is our opportunity to look at circling from that perspective. Uh, and let me be clear once again, because this is somewhat different from the rest of the retreat. When I talk about this perspective, I'm talking about the truth. And I'm aware that that term may trigger some of you. Uh, you believe in the truth that there isn't truth. And I'm here to reveal your ignorance. So to begin, I'd like to suggest that you uh, cultivate humility, which I know is difficult, especially when someone tells you to do it, but good news, you can handle it. We ought to cultivate humility rather than conceit regarding uh, our modern way of looking at things. Uh, of course, we have been trained to believe in our modern way of looking at things uh, for many reasons, but this is our opportunity to escape from that. And uh, our uh, patterns uh, are worth at least being able to break. It's worth being at least capable of breaking patterns, patterns around both what we do, but also how we understand. Uh, and so I'd suggest to you, it's worth considering the fact that the uh, destruction of life on Earth is, uh, is a, a tragedy that correlates very well with the rise of the modern mind. So the way you see things is let's just say possibly, but I would say probably, the reason for the problems on the planet right now. So it's worth having humility regarding those views. Uh, it's worth at least trying occasionally, say for 46 minutes. It's worth trying to set that aside. <clears throat> uh, and in order to bring you uh, into a somewhat different state of mind, I'd like to tell you a story. 
It's an excellent story. It's a very, very good story that uh, is worth telling. Yes? It's a story worth recounting, as they say. So, a uh, long time ago, about 2,500 years and far, far away, in the northern part of the Indian subcontinent, at the base in the foothills of the Himavanta range, the, uh, the Himalayas, uh, <clears throat> there was a kingdom, a wonderful kingdom, a beautiful kingdom that was uh, wealthy and peaceful. And, uh, the king there, Shudodana, was an excellent king, good man. His wife, uh, the queen, Mahamaya, wonderful queen, wonderful woman. They uh, had a son named Siddhartha. And he is known in history as Siddhartha Gautama of the Shakyan clan. And nowadays we refer to him as Shakya Muni Buddha. Muni means literally silent, but in this case it means a sage. So the sage of the Shakyan clan, the Buddha Gautama. Uh, <clears throat> he, this Buddha, changed world history. Uh, I'd say he changed world history more than anyone else ever has. And not only that, but that he's changed it for the better. Uh, it's difficult to do that. Many of us here may have tried doing that, and we know how hard it is. Uh, it was a long path to awakening for him. A long path. He spent the first few decades of his life living in indulgence. And self-indulgence, that was his way. That was his way of finding happiness. It was a way of finding happiness that had been taught to him. It was given to him by his father, most famously, but in fact, his whole society. Uh, he was a prince, after all. So he had, it said, three palaces. And he had the best food, wonderful food, magnificent curries and sauces and rice. Uh, he had uh, music played all the time and entertainment whenever he wanted it. And all of the people who were there entertaining him, it is said, were female. And I'll let your imagination carry the images for a bit. Why would they say that all of the entertainment was performed by females? Hmm. Okay. So I think you probably all have that image now, and it's worth having. Uh, it's worth knowing that that was a part of his life, that level of self-indulgence and sensual pleasure. Uh, naturally, this level of self-indulgence couldn't be, you'd say, infinite. Uh, and in fact, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't you know, the pleasure of the heavenly realms or something. Uh, and it wasn't even the pleasure that we nowadays have, all of us here. Uh, all of us here have magnificent food, right? I mean, we, we have, say, peppers and tomatoes. Imagine Indian food without peppers and tomatoes. You know, not nearly as good as it is now. So even though we ate Indian food all the time, it wasn't, you know, excellent Indian food because they didn't have peppers or tomatoes. So how are you supposed to make really good curry with neither of those ingredients? However good his palaces were, he didn't have uh, this waterfall of, of warm water at exactly the temperature that you wish uh, <clears throat> that he could just walk into each day. He <clears throat> uh, couldn't 
uh, he anyway, couldn't fly all over the place like we can, seeing whatever scenery he wished, and he couldn't uh, surf the internet. So even though he had quite a bit of self-indulgence, he didn't have infinite self-indulgence, and in fact, all of us here know more self-indulgence than he did. But for him at the time, there was a lot of self-indulgence there, and the point is that he had an attitude of self-indulgence. That was the way to be happy. Uh, indulge one's self-centered uh, desires. You could say carnal pleasures. So he tried that. He tried it. He thought it might work. Everyone told him it would work. It didn't work. He was not happy. It was an ineffective method. It failed. He tried it for uh, almost 30 years, decades, and it just didn't work. And he, like some of us here, realized there's a point at which you have to conclude that the strategy isn't working. You can't try it forever. At a certain point, you have to say, I gave it a good shot, and it didn't work. Uh, so some of us here may have been trying this method for decades. Some of us here may be mature like him and realize it doesn't work, but let's face it, most of us here have not realized that. So he anyway realized it and moved on. And he tried a different technique. He tried something different. And that technique was self-mortification. Uh, so he put himself through various extremely painful practices. He felt that if, if the indulgence of sensual pleasure doesn't work for achieving true happiness, well then, the creation of sensual pain, as much pain as possible, physical pain, that might work. And so he did the various methods that Indian ascetics are known for, these horrifying methods of mortifying the body. Uh, and did that for years, but that didn't work either. It just didn't work, and there came a point then also when he gave up. He realized, I have taken self-mortification as far as anyone can without killing themselves. No one has ever taken it this far without killing themselves in all of history, and it didn't work. It failed. I'm still not happy. I'm still not authentic. I'm still not true. So there must be another way. This is a person of enormous courage. And so he came to the conclusion that he would try what has been called <clears throat> through the centuries, the millennia since, the middle way. And this talk now is about the middle way. <clears throat> the middle way. How long did he practice the middle way? As I say, he practiced self-indulgence for decades. He practiced self-mortification for years. Does anyone know how long he practiced the middle way? Well, I'm sure somebody knows. 40 years. Oh, that's a good point. <laughs> yes, that's true. 45 years is a good way to put it. That's a good way to put it. I like that. How long did he practice the middle way before uh, achieving it? Before, so you, you take the middle way, the eightfold path, and then you finish that, and then you realize the fruit of that, which is liberation and uh, vision and knowledge, uh, the vision and knowledge of liberation. So how long did he practice before realizing the fruit of the middle way? Somebody must know this. Sad if no one knows. Yeah, so in, in many traditions, they say one week, but in the classical texts, what did they say? Not six years. That was a time of ascetic, ascetic training. What do you say? Oh, yeah, so that's another good way to look at it. So you could say that he, <laughs> that, he, that he spent aeons, many, many aeons, billions of years, trillions of years, quadrillions of years, quadrillions of quadrillions of years, uh, many aeons of universal expansion, many aeons of universal contraction. So consider how old the universe is now since what they call, since the scientists talk about the Big Bang. So since this Big Bang, how long has it been? It's been 
a while. It's been a long time. It's been longer than you can imagine. And we're not even finished expanding. The universe isn't even finished expanding yet. So this is just, this is a, just a, a moment in terms of how long this individual spent attempting to perfect the way. Uh, and so that's another good way to look at it. But there is another way, which is he gave up on self mortification. He, he gave up on self indulgence after decades. He then practiced self mortification for years. He gave up on that. And then he realized, aha, I will try the middle way. And then he found a tree and he thought, this will suffice for striving. And he sat down to strive and he committed, I will not get up from this position until my mind is completely liberated. And how long was it until his mind was completely liberated? So some people say 40 days is true. Some people say a week. Some people say 40 days. Sunrise means how many hours? Yeah, something like 10 to 12 hours. That's how long it took. So we go from aeons to decades to years. And then when he finally found the middle way, it took hours. And since then, since his total realization of awakening, of the truth, it isn't just somebody's opinion, since then, he, his teaching, his dispensation, has been helping people for millennia. That 12 hours of work was time well spent. <laughs> Yes. He found a seed of absolute truth that has been able to be clothed in culture after culture. Culture after culture has been able to make use of this teaching. And right now we here are learning how to clothe it in our cultural assumptions and uh, help even more people. Now, it's important to know what the purpose of the middle way is. What's the purpose of practicing, you could say, Buddhism, which is how I'm couching my analysis of circling. Uh, what's, the, what's the purpose of Buddhism? Yeah, you could say the end of suffering. That's right. The end of suffering is the purpose of Buddhism. And what is the end of suffering? The end of suffering is the complete understanding of suffering. So you could just say that the purpose of Buddhism is the complete understanding of suffering. That's why we practice, for the complete understanding of suffering. Now, the complete understanding of suffering is the cessation of suffering. That is the end of suffering. If you haven't experienced the end of suffering, then obviously you haven't completely understood it, because the end of suffering is an aspect of suffering. So it's necessary to move all the way through suffering to its end, and in doing that, in completely understanding suffering, we're free of it. What is the path that allows us to completely understand suffering? What is that? It's called the Eightfold Path. And I'd suggest that circling, if done well, is a way to teach people to practice aspects of the Eightfold Path that have not yet been uh, successfully conveyed to our culture. That is what I would suggest circling is, primarily right speech. Uh, so, well said, Brooks. <laughs> Brooks mentioned this at, at lunch a few days ago. Uh, the Eightfold Path has come to us in, uh, in a, as Daniel has said, a depraved form. That was the word you used, yes? At breakfast. Oh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the Eightfold Path has come to us in a, in a depraved form, which is to say that um, not because anybody's bad. I'm not blaming anyone for this. I actually appreciate the people who have, who have done this. Uh, and a lot of the time when I give these talks, everybody assumes I'm mad at people or something, but I appreciate what people have done. It's just, we have, it's just there, there are limitations to what any given person can do. And so what's happened is that 
of the various parts of the Eightfold Path, the part that has come to us most skillfully, most completely, is right mindfulness. Uh, but the fact is, even mindfulness, <clears throat> as it has come to us, is in a depraved form. Uh, we don't even know what mindfulness is. So, beyond that problem, I'll get to what mindfulness is, assuming I finish this section of the talk. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> the problem with right mindfulness, though, the large problem isn't just that it isn't taught in its complete form. The larger problem with, with mindfulness as it's taught is that it isn't taught based on any other part of the Eightfold Path. And so you end up not being able to practice it well because you haven't prepared to practice it well. Uh, I would suggest again that what circling does is prepare us for right mindfulness and then right samadhi. Uh, it prepares us by, by doing the things that, that are supposed to happen before you get to right mindfulness and right samadhi. And there are a lot of those things. Those things are, are taught, are actually practiced primarily in community, in relationship, uh, in connection. And <clears throat> many of you have heard me and other people who have come here who have trained for a long time in monasteries, talk about our experience in monasteries. And usually when you think of somebody in a monastery, they're alone, meditating, having some blissful experience. And that's the thing that we think of. We think, ah, yes, you're, you're in this perfect place where there are no problems and no people and no issues, and you were sitting in a cave and you were blissful. Well, that happens. I did that. <laughs> I did that for a long time. I sat, it wasn't a cave, but it was a little stone hut in the Himalayas, and I sat there for a long time and was blissful. It's true. It happens. But that isn't most of what happened. Most of what happened was that I was in a monastery arguing with somebody about who swept that part of the zendo. <laughs> <clears throat> and why? Because there's obviously dirt right there. <laughs> And how should you cut the carrots? Anyway, for this particular soup, everyone knows that you shouldn't cut it like that. Well, I already cut half of them like that. I'm not going to cut the other half differently. That would look worse. <laughs> yes? So this is mostly what happens in monasteries. <laughs> but you, all, you already know this. I don't know, I don't know why you're laughing at that. <laughs> So, <laughs> so you're already familiar with the fact that most of what happens in monasteries is that people get mad at each other over things that don't matter. <laughs> and this is how you prepare for right mindfulness. This is how you prepare for samadhi. Samadhi means, uh, samadhi means something like, uh, uh, hmm. something like, uh, entering, maybe you could say, altered states of consciousness that lead to insight, that, that set the stage for insight. Uh, sublime states that allow you to escape from the trappings of the world, and uh, which includes even your own physical form, and that allows you to increase the likelihood that, you, that, that insight will, will be revealed. Uh, so it's by connecting with people, it's by relating to people, that we learn the basic skills needed for the latter parts of the Eightfold Path. And most people don't understand this, and so even though you've heard people come, a number of people come, and you've heard me say again and again, that while yes, the insights are really good, yes, the bliss is really good. I mean, the bliss is really good. It's better than you can imagine. It's a lot better than you can imagine. Uh, the insights are very profound, much more profound than you could possibly imagine. Uh, you couldn't even start to conceive of a way to imagine how profound the insights can be, much less imagine it. 
Uh, so <clears throat> that's all really good. And yet the thing that we emphasize the most, if you, if you listen, <laughs> which you should be doing right now, you should be listening right now. That's what you should be doing. Is, is, is listening part of circling? Oh, okay. Good. Well, listen. <laughs> You've been training yourself to listen for a little while. I hope you should have. So if you haven't, do it now. If you have, make use of what you've gained. Listen to this. The <clears throat> most important aspect of this training is living in community. That's where it really comes down to the, that's where the power really comes from. It's in that that we learn the various skills needed for the latter stages of the path. And how is that? Well, we have views. We have views. And the first part of the Eightfold Path is called right view. Samyak drishti. And drishti, I think view is a good uh, translation of that word. The right way of looking at things. Uh, now, this is a description of how things are. This is a description of how things are. This description of how things are is not yet ultimate. This is called mundane right view. It's the right view that you start the path with, not the right view you end the path with. But it isn't that when you finish the path, you give up this kind of right view. It's just that this is an approximation. You use it for, for teaching and um, describing. But it is the correct way of seeing things if you want to be of benefit in the world and achieve awakening, uh, if you want to transcend suffering. There, there is a right view. There's a right way to see things. And in community, you get to live with a lot of people who have a lot of different views and see who it is who, on the one hand, is the nicest sort of a person who you like, and also who tends to achieve deep states and even insight. And what sort of view is it that achieves that? What, how, how is it that a person sees the, the, the world as it is? And again, this is about how things are. This is about how things are. Each religion, whatever that religion is, that could be humanism as a religion, which means you believe that human beings are the center of the universe. It could be Christianity as a religion, or you believe God is the center of the universe. It could be uh, science as a religion that believes that the material world is the center of the universe, and that one, I mean, that one actually takes it pretty far and says there's nothing else in the universe. Uh, whatever religion you have, it, it has an is, it has a way things are, and an ought, what you should therefore do. It has an is and an ought. This is a description of how things are, and therefore, you should do this sort of thing. In successful religions, the ought makes the, the things that you do with your mind, your communication, and your physical acts cause you to see the is again. So it becomes a feedback loop. The more you behave the way you ought to, the more you see this way that things are. The more you see this way, see in this way, the more you behave in this way. So the more you perceive in this way, the more you behave in this way. The more you behave in this way, the more you see in this way. And that's how religions maintain themselves. And so the first two parts of the Eightfold Path are right view and right thought. The right thought is the, the ought, the, the thing you should do. Uh, now, but for, before we get to that, what is right view? Basically, right view is this. Right view is the teaching. The way, the way that things really are that you should believe you should believe this. If you don't believe this, then uh, you're going to have a hard time on this path. And if you're not open to considering this, you can't walk this path. Uh, right view is simply this. You must personally face everything you do. You have to personally face the consequences of everything you do. Every thought you have, every word you say, and every act that you uh, participate in. You cannot escape from any of it. 
you must face it. You must. Like it or not, believe it or not, you must. There are real consequences to every action you take, whether that's mind, speech, body, and you can't avoid them, which is to say that they don't end at death. Ah, now things got real. Yes, they don't end for you at death. It isn't just that they don't end. You know, you did something and then other people have to deal with it. No, you have to deal with it after you die. And the stuff you're dealing with now is in large part, although not entirely, definitely not entirely, but in large part due to the things that you did before, before in this lifetime or even before that. What this means, the significance of this is, is profound because the claim, the, the, the claim about the way things are is based on this underlying truth. And that truth is there really is love. And there really is hate. There really is love. And it's so real, it will create your future if you engage in it. There really is hate. And it's so real, it will create your future if you engage in it. And you can't avoid it. If you engage in love, your future is going to move forth accordingly. If you engage in hate, your future is going to move forth accordingly. To see this is to see right view. But there is one more aspect of right view that matters. And that is <clears throat> that there are people who understand this. And they're right. And if you don't understand it, you're wrong. And you should train with those people so they can teach you what's right, so that you can successfully navigate the world according to these laws. Because these are laws, and you can't do anything about them. It's just how it is. This is right view. And the nice thing <coughs> about uh, living in community is that you get to see, because we don't want to believe this, especially modern people. And I'll get to this in a second about why we don't want to believe this. Because it's a good reason that we don't want to believe this. It's just a terrible reason. When you live in community, you get to see that people who believe this are good people. And people who don't believe this are bad people. I mean, in general, averaged out. The more people believe this, the more you can trust them. And you just see this play out with time. You just watch it. And beyond that, the people who believe this get enlightened more. <laughs> and so you see, not only is it beneficial to all of us, it's even beneficial to the person who believes it. And so if only for the sake of benefit, it's worth trying out. Later on, of course we have to take this on faith to a certain extent. Later on, we may be able to confirm or deny the, the claims of mundane right view, that there really is rebirth and that it happens according to your actions and such, uh, and that there are really people who can guide you in this. But it's by living in community that we see, oh, interesting, the people who believe in right view, that there's nothing you can do about it, you have to face it, these people are more responsible. These people are less likely to uh, fall into, say, a victim mentality, in which case it's okay for them to do whatever because they're defending themselves. Well, it doesn't matter if you're defending yourself. You still have to face what you did when you were defending yourself. You have no choice. You have to deal with it. And so the people who see that this is really how it is behave better. And this is something that I would never have, have learned if I didn't live in community. But the reason that we resist it so much is actually quite simple as far as I can tell, and it's simple because this view, right view, is incompatible with the modern economy. So it's essential that all of you have been brainwashed to believe that it's wrong. It's absolutely incompatible with capitalism, with, the, with this economy as we know it. If people believed in right view, we couldn't do the things that we do. It's impossible. We can do it now because it makes sense. I mean, you just die when you die. So you got to protect yourself and get, and get what you can get, and then you're going to die, and the next generation is going to deal with global warming. But no, it's not like that. You don't get to escape from global warming just by dying. It's, much, it's a much bigger problem than that. 
Now, if you actually saw things this way, if we, if we saw things this way, then this whole system would collapse. So it's of the utmost importance that you've been trained from an early age to believe in, in, in other views. One view is you're made purely of matter, and that's all there really is. And the other view is that your emotions are the supreme authority in the universe. These are the two most common religions taught to us in the modern age, religious views. Okay, so back to the Eightfold Path. Right thought. Thought, the second part is right thought. Now, right thought is, is something more, it isn't really so much thought, thought, although it's a good translation, but it's something more like the, way, the word dream in the phrase the American dream. Okay, so what do you think things should be like? What do you think you should strive for? How do you understand yourself and the world in terms of what we need to create, what we need to, to, uh, to change? What's the goal of life, you could say? Uh, right thought in terms of Buddhism is the statement that you should have a dream, you should have an intention, you should have a vision, you should have a goal that is based on letting go, on not being hateful, and on not being mean. And it's incredible that that's all they say. If you can come up with a goal that is based on renunciation, on relinquishment, on not hating anyone and on not being mean to anyone, do it. Go for it. <laughs> Just right away. Don't hesitate. Try to do that. It's an excellent way of thinking, uh, excellent way of, of considering your future. And this, I've noticed in terms of circling, is very important to have. Uh, it's really important to have the sense, okay, I'm here, I'm, I'm going to let go of my need to control everything. I'm going to relinquish, even relinquish my views, maybe. I'm going to relinquish my ways of looking at things, my patterns, I'm going to let go. I'm also not going to be mean to anyone, and even if I'm mean, I'm not going to be mean about it. And I'm not going to be, and I'm not going to be hateful. I'm not going to have this hateful attitude of, if I could only destroy myself and you, then the world would be a better place. Instead of that, we're going to accept what happens, accept ourselves, accept each other. We're going to have that way of considering the conversation. If we can have that right thought, then we can move into right speech. And I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this one than the other. So right speech uh, is what I see as, as a lot of what's happening in circling. Uh, it's been very hard for us to teach right speech so far in the modern world. And I think that circling could be a very powerful uh, means to bring this to life. Because the way right speech is usually discussed is, as usual, in negatives. So most of this is right. The, the right way of doing things is, is usually taught simply by don't do the wrong thing. So it's usually taught in a negative way. Uh, for example, don't hate. It doesn't tell you to love even. It just says don't hate. And why is that? It's because if you tell someone what to do, you really limit them. But if you just tell people what to not do, then you're giving them a lot more agency and freedom. Okay? So, so the reason it's done in a negative sense is because of a sense of trust in your judgment rather than trying to make you get on a set of train tracks and only go in that one direction. So in terms of right speech, what it means is that you, you're able to communicate, you're able to have a relationship uh, in which you do not engage in falsehood, you do not engage in lying, uh, you do not um, engage in what's called harsh speech, so you don't speak in a way that's intentionally going to cause harm, you don't engage in divisive speech, so you're not trying to divide this, these from those or those from these, and you don't engage in meaningless, irrelevant chatter. Uh, so I have the sense that circling is a very good way to explore right speech. Because when we think about this, we hear the formula, no false speech, no, cruel, no harsh speech, no divisive speech, no meaningless speech. Okay, right, that's that. It doesn't come to life, but in circling, this actually comes to life. 
And it comes to life because you see, as Peter mentioned uh, early in the, in the beginning of the retreat, how hard it is to say even one authentic thing. To say even one thing that's not false. It isn't just that you accurately convey that lunch is at 105. That's fine. Okay. That's not false speech in a way. But that's what I'd call dead false speech. Dead right speech. It's, <laughs> it's, it's right speech. You didn't exactly lie. But was it authentic? Did you actually say that? And did you connect with the person while you said it? Was there something honest and true communicated? Did that happen or not? And we see, we try, and we don't. It's not authentic, and we can tell it's not authentic. It is false. I'm being a false person while I say this. I'm even saying a true thing, but in a false way. And we're trapped in it. We realize, I'm always engaged in wrong speech. I'm constantly speaking in an inauthentic and untrue way. And we're, we're stuck with it. And then we learn through a retreat, hopefully, or maybe longer, how to say even one true thing. That's amazing to be able to say one true thing. And we realize how amazing it is, how rare it is to say one true thing. And then we keep on training and we can say another true thing. We now have done it twice, and that's a big deal. Because if you can do it twice, that's completely different. If you can do it once, that's completely different. But if you can do it twice, that's different. And if you can do it three times, then you realize you can do it. I can do this. I know how to do this now. And it's, it's enlivening. And now you have a live right speech. Beyond that, <clears throat> there's this sense of harsh speech. And you can say, well, I wasn't being harsh because I didn't actually swear at them while I told them about themselves. Okay, I mean, yeah, that's not harsh speech in a way, but it isn't, it isn't the thing we're talking about. I mean, do you think that this tradition would have lasted thousands of years based on that level of achievement? <laughs> so what, is it, what does it mean? Well, we see what it is. We see how it is in a circle, in this kind of communication, that it's possible to say any number of things in a way that isn't actually harsh or mean. Even if you are really saying something that might hurt, you can still say that in a way that isn't harsh speech. It's amazing, actually. And beyond that, you can engage in... Uh, so speech here is communication. And of course, it's about speaking, but it's about communication, which is to say it's also about listening. Isn't there listening and circling? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so <laughs> the listening also can be harsh, right? You can listen in a harsh way, and you realize, oh, wait, I don't have to do that either. I'm capable of speaking in a way that we're, whatever I'm saying, it's actually spoken from a place of, of right thought, which is to say it's not harsh, it's not hateful. Whatever it is, however painful it may be, and we realize that, that harsh speech doesn't just mean that you don't make people feel bad. It's not about that. How people feel, whether somebody feels bad, isn't the supreme authority in the universe. To, be, to engage in harsh speech doesn't just mean you don't make people feel bad. On the contrary, you could engage in harsh speech that makes somebody feel good. Because you could use that speech to trap them. Beyond that, you can listen in a way that's harsh, even if it feels good. Instead of that, it's about knowing how to bring forth right thought, this true intention of, of goodwill, into our speech so that we can say things that are painful, and it's still loving. So now things are starting to come to life. Beyond that, there is this divisive, divisive side of speech. Just actually, I want to give just one example of this, of how this can come to life in circling. Um, so something I've noticed in watching... Okay, let me back up a little bit. I am extremely comfortable with discomfort. 
I am not only very comfortable with my own discomfort, which I am, I'm very comfortable with yours. It doesn't really bother me if you're in a lot of pain. Just so you know. That's not being mean. It's because I trust you. It's because I believe in you. Same as I believe in myself. Now, it's necessary for us to care for each other and to want each other to be happy and safe, of course. That's right thought. We already talked about that just now when we talk about mean being, being mean or harsh in our speech. And with the right thought, okay, fine. But... While divisive speech is often just interpreted as not telling rumors about one person to other people so that they dislike each other, of course you can think about it that way, but what I'm referring to is actually much more tricky. And that is this thing that I've seen you guys do a lot of, which I appreciate because it's right thought and everything, so it's good that you do it. I'm not telling you to not do it. I'm just saying it's interesting to watch you all protecting each other. You really do that a lot. There's so much protecting each other. This person says something to that person, and you want to step in the middle and prevent the message from getting through. This is called divisive speech. This is dividing this person from that person, keeping them apart. Now you think you're being nice, but instead you've divided these from those, as it says in the text. You think you're being protective, but, is, but that is a form of divisive speech. That's a way of causing harm in a community, even though it feels quite fulfilling to do, like we're being a savior. The problem, though, is that, and the thing that's so difficult, the challenge that all of this puts us in, is the question of, how do we deal with the fact that so often we believe that we should be protected from the truth? If we see it in that way, then we believe that truth is the enemy. And if you think that the truth is the enemy, you're, it's over. You understand? It's pure conflict from now on. If the truth is what we have to protect ourselves from, that's the end. There's no way forward. It's then just your delusion against the entire universe forever. To make the truth into the enemy is horrifying, and this protectiveness can easily be not just divisive speech between people, but actually trying to divide someone away from the truth. And so in this way, we begin to see how circling can really bring this to life. And then, of course, there's meaningless speech. There's meaningless chatter, irrelevance. And um, this also is something that I think circling puts us into a, a very uh, rich field of confusion. Because what is relevant anyway? It seems so obvious until you say circling, right? So a lot of the time, somebody's talking about something important to them, and you jump in and talk about something. Well, even if maybe they're talking about themselves, and you say, yeah, I have that experience too, that can, it may seem relevant, it may not be relevant. It may be the wrong thing to say. But beyond that, you may think that what you have to say is unrelated and irrelevant. And then you still say it, and it turns out it was exactly what was needed. It was completely relevant. It was the most important thing to say, even though it seems at the outset as if there's no connection. So what is meaningless, irrelevant chatter? What is that? If a lot of the time you listen to these conversations, and it would fit into most people's understanding of meaningless chatter of gossip, right? A lot of the conversations here seem, sorry, I, I mean, I was coming and going, and I come in and think, wow, this is exactly what most people would think of. This is, <laughs> what, if I recorded this and had people listen to it and say, is, would, you def, would you call this meaningless chatter? <laughs> They'd say, that is quintessential meaningless <laughs> chatter, right? 
And the question is, is it? Is it? We can, we can, we can take that perspective, but we're losing. But as you've seen, it may not be irrelevant, meaningless chatter. Precisely the thing that needed to be said may have been said. On the other hand, it may not have been. I mean, I'm not saying there's no such thing as meaningless chatter and circling. I don't know, maybe you think that there isn't, but mm, I think that there could be. The, the point is that it puts us in a place of needing to completely reformulate our understanding of what irrelevant speech is. Completely reassess why something would or wouldn't be relevant. Is it just because it's not on the same topic? As if there, there isn't a clear through line? Is that all? If so, then that's what I'd call dead right speech. Okay? But there's a wisdom that comes forth as we engage in this, in which we realize, no, there are much deeper, more alive, more complex connections between things that we say than we had previously thought, and we start to see the connections that we couldn't see before. As we do all this, as we engage in learning how to not engage in false speech, not engage in harsh speech, not engage in divisive speech, not engage in meaningless speech, as we do that in circling, we gain the ability to do that in meditation. And a lot of people think, no, you should learn it in meditation while you're still and silent and alone in a cave. You shouldn't. Of course, you may have to, because you didn't learn it in a social context. But the better context to learn concentration in is in a conversation. Because then you don't have to depend on yourself to notice that you're distracted, that you've gotten engaged in meaningless chatter. Someone else will say, hey, did you, do we lose each other there? Come back. Right? Someone else will, will catch you. Or you start to engage in this divisive uh, speech. You start to engage in it with someone, but they call you on it. You'll note that as, you, as you're sitting, you also engage in that, trying to protect yourself from your own experience, right? Well, it's really nice if someone else notices that you tend to protect yourself or others from, you know, experience. <laughs> if you have to protect yourself from ex if <laughs> that that's terrible. If you have to protect yourself from experience, that is sad. So <clears throat> you notice how it is that your social relationships provide you with the opportunity to learn the basic skills that you later apply in a higher and more sublime form in meditation. The same thing with harsh speech. How often is it as we meditate that we are mad at ourselves, hating ourselves, telling ourselves you're wrong again for getting distracted again. That was meaningless speech in your mind. It's chatter in your mind again, you idiot. Why don't you just stop that for once? How often do we do this? Well, it's hard when you're alone sitting to stop that. It's really difficult to, to no longer do that. But if you're in a relationship, you're called on it right away. You're just called on it. And you don't even have to be told, hey, idiot, stop calling yourself an idiot. You can just, as is done, as I've seen happen, is just, okay, so what's it like to talk to, to, talk to somebody that way, to talk to yourself that way? What, what's that like? Tell me more. That's it. And then the truth, the fact that you're not protecting yourself, avoiding the truth, does its own work on you. And of course, people tend to call you on inauthenticity. So it's very helpful. It's very useful to gain the skills that people typically don't have when they meditate in a non-meditative context, for example, in relationship. Uh, <clears throat> it's too often that people around here anyway think that when you're talking about chores or in free time talking about the weather or whatever it is, that, you're not, that that's not an opportunity to practice. That is the opportunity to practice. That's where you learn the skills that you'll later apply in meditation. That's the ideal time to learn it, not in meditation. Of course, when you actually sit down, you just have to work with what you have. But you should try to gain the skills 
before that in relationship. Okay, very good. So then you, you have done that. You've now worked through right view. Actually, what are they again? What's the first one? Right view. Good job. And the second one? Yeah, thought. Exactly. Something like thought. Aspiration, dream, vision. Next one? Right speech. That's right. And the next one, does anyone know? Right action. So um, right action is, again, usually defined very simply. Don't kill. Don't kill. Don't steal and don't engage in sexual misconduct. So what we've talked about here, the Eightfold Path and, the, and these, um, these basic precepts that we've been over, um, as many of you probably know, they've been absorbed into yogic Hinduism to a large extent, the Ashtanga Yoga and the Yamas and Niyamas and such. Um, and their, their power is demonstrated in, in more traditions than merely Buddhism, uh, this, these points are, are not to be taken so simply. It isn't just about not destroying life, not stealing, not committing sexual misconduct. But I'd suggest that the place where right action is originally, in any case, practiced is in movement exercises. Are you dancing with someone? I saw, I saw a lot of that, engaged in some of it. Are you moving with someone in, a, in the right way? Now, what's that? How do you know? How do you find out? How do you explore that? So yes, we say don't destroy life, don't steal, don't commit sexual misconduct. But right action is much more profound than that. That, that isn't alive. That's not, an, that's not a living definition. That's just the definition that dead words in books can, can convey. But you shouldn't think that just because books can't convey the living path means that there is no living path, just that that medium can't carry it. You have to carry it in your own body. And right action, which is to say how you move through space, that is at least the beginning, not the end, but the beginning of right action. Through that, you discover through that level of engagement how you can live. But that is a very different way, how you can live ethically. But that is a different source of wisdom than just trying to follow rules. Of course, we follow rules. Nothing wrong with following rules, but it's best to realize the state of mind that correctly discovered those rules. Originally, somebody had to come up with a rule. Why not you? <laughs> 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 once you've done that, once you've engaged in, what are they again? Right view? Right, view? right action, then finally, you're at this crucial turning point. And the crucial turning point is that of right livelihood. Right livelihood means that you actually change how you live. Right livelihood means that you actually change how you live. You completely change how you live. Or at least, you're willing to completely change how you live. Once we've done these others, then we're in a position to try this, and this is the great test. The question is very simple. Are we willing to give up our way of life? It's a very simple question. If you can say yes, then you pass the test, and you can move on to transcendence. If you can't say yes, then you should keep on working on right view, right thought, right speech, and right action. Can you completely surrender? Completely relinquish your way of life. Once again, this is not taught in most forms of modern Buddhism. Why? Because this is incompatible with the modern economy. The force, the, the engine that is running the efforts, uh, the uh, promulgation efforts of the path nowadays, that engine, capitalism, needs to filter the parts of the path that will destroy it. <clears throat> right view and right livelihood are the two most significant ones. And therefore, I want to be clear about something important around right livelihood. This is going to be a little tough, maybe. But if I had to come up with the um, most... Uh, critical way of describing circling. The description of circling that is most negative 
is that circling is the way that you can experience intimacy without friendship. So if you're not willing to be friends with someone, but you want to experience intimacy with them anyway, circle. <laughs> if you're not willing to actually change how you live so that you live with people you trust who are going to help you along in life, so that you really commit to them so that you're going to be there for them when they need it, if you don't want that, if you don't want real connection, but then you're sort of lonely and you want to feel better anyway, good news, we've got circling. Circling will allow you to connect with people in a very brief period of time. You don't have to really know them or care about them or help them, and they won't care about you or help you either. Good news. It's totally safe. It doesn't change your life at all. It makes you feel a little bit better for a little while. And if you practice it sufficiently, then you'll become increasingly uh, narcissistic and numb. For this reason, I'm emphasizing right livelihood. Because circling, I believe, hmm, nope, circling, <laughs> not just what I believe, circling ought to change our lives so that we can develop true friendships. If it doesn't do that, then it's bad. It's not good enough to just come up with a trick so that people who live in our economy moving here and there never want to commit to anything ever can succeed at that. The purpose of circling should not be to just let people be lonely without feeling it. This is about our lives. This is about how we live. And if circling isn't at least a bridge to questioning and changing how we live so that we make real friends who we can really count on and who can really count on us, circling doesn't do that, then I suggest we'd be better off without it. Because otherwise it's just a way of tricking us into thinking we're okay when we're not into thinking that we're making the changes needed in order to save the world when we're not. If we can come to the point when we can actually change our lives, then for the first time, we, can, we have a chance at enlightenment. We, because we live in this way, we live in this horrifying culture that is destroying the planet. Because of that, we naturally feel shame. We feel terrible self-hatred. And a lot of the time, as Miles was saying, we understand meditation to be something like sit down and hate yourself, but be okay with it. <laughs> if we can actually change how we live, then this shame dissolves. And it doesn't dissolve just because you change the way you talk to yourself. You don't talk to yourself that way anymore because you don't have any reason to. Because the word, you say the words, you're a bad person, and then you can just say, no. Mm -hmm. And that's that. Mm -hmm. We know that we're complicit or more likely participatory in this machine that's destroying the world. Of course we feel bad about it. Of course we feel bad about ourselves. We've been trained to feel bad about ourselves so that we become more complicit in the machine that makes us feel bad about ourselves. And I'd suggest that we should skillfully feel bad about ourselves. Of course we should. Come on. You should do it in a skillful way. You shouldn't hurt yourself over it. But we should face what's going on, face our place in it, and change it. We have to be motivated to do that by regret. By a sense of, you could say, shame, remorse concern, conscience. And if we're not willing to feel that, then we're not going to change our lives. If we're not going to change our lives, then we can never experience a completely new kind of energy, a completely new kind of power, which is called right effort. This is a completely new power. And why do you have it? Because you trust yourself. The fact is, you always had it. 
you always had this power inside of yourself, this incredible energy that's capable of anything, but you weren't willing to let yourself use it because you knew that you were a bad person who shouldn't use it. Of course you caged yourself. You caged yourself because you're compassionate, because you knew that you would do bad things, because your life demonstrates that you do bad things with your power. It's serious. Naturally, you're, you disempower yourself. Thank you. The way to change that isn't just give yourself power without changing your ethics in your life. The way to change it is you change your ethics in your life and then, in, and then you realize, oh, I should have that much power now. I should. And the moment you know you should, you can just reach out and grab it. It's been inside of you this whole time. It's not like you have to search somewhere. It's in your eyes and your ears and your body and your mind right now. But you're not using it because your ethics demonstrate that you shouldn't. If you can change your life, totally surrender, then you trust yourself enough to gather up your strength and apply it to what is actually needed, which isn't to go out there and change other people. It isn't to come up with some idea about how everyone should be and then fix them so that they're more like your concept of them. Because we've actually changed our lives and brought forth right effort, we've, we can see through that, that facile solution, that meaningless, that uh, deluded solution of I'm going to have an idea about how you should be and get, you to, and get you to be that way, and by fixing you, the world will be a better place. We completely drop that and enter what actually needs to be done, which is right mindfulness. We'd apply our right effort to right mindfulness. Right mindfulness means that we remember to practice all the time. That's what mindfulness is. And by practicing all the time, we finally come to the point when we can enter right samadhi. Because we enter right samadhi, right concentration, right rapture, because of that, we're capable of attaining true insight, which is right view. And by attaining true insight, right view, it becomes impossible for this machine to trap us again. And we're free from this evil structure. From that place, we may choose out of compassion to re-enter it in order to reformulate it, to make it easier to break. My concern about what's happening here in circling isn't just that it can be uh, intimacy without friendship, but it is that, um, well, let me put it this way. I'll change the order here. Talk is going long, deal with it. <laughs> so what I have seen, <clears throat> um, you do circling, right? You can handle it, right? Yeah, come on. <laughs> So what I've actually, what I've seen, um, no, I can't change the order of it. Okay, come with me on a bit of an apparent tangent, but we'll come back. So I want to talk a little bit about modern assumptions and values, because I think many of you may not have noticed them. One of them is called equality. Yes, we really like equality. It's been an exciting theme for a few hundred years now. Um, <laughs> People, people really believe in it, even though they don't practice it. And, the more, and, and you'll note that societies that believe in equality more are less equal. You should note this. Our society, for example, believes in equality enormously, and we're one of the least equal societies in the history of the world. Uh, it's one of our main values in the U.S. And we are not. We are, we are one of the most unequal <laughs> in terms of wealth, power, education, et cetera, uh, societies of all time. <laughs> uh, in particular, we like equality in terms of validity of opinion. So everybody gets to have their own perspective, right? You think what you think, and I think what I think, and 
you can think what you think, and I can think what I think. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a sense that there, that there is, in some true way, an equality of opinion. Uh, beyond that, as I already mentioned, we believe that emotions have supreme authority, that human emotion is the basis of wisdom and truth in the universe, and how people feel is the most important part of the world. Um, there are a lot of examples that demonstrate this because it's hard for people to understand, to imagine anything else. So one example is that in the old days, in say Europe, you, if you, you're married to someone and you want to be with someone else, then you go to the priest and you say, I'm married to this person, but I want to be with that person. They're going to say something like, well, the scriptures say such and such, and so don't do it. Nowadays, you go, you say, I'm married. You, nowadays, you go to our modern priests who are psychotherapists, thera you know, counselors and such. So these are the priests nowadays. These are, these are our modern priests, ministers of, of humanism, of the sense that, that our emotions are most important. So, you know, you know what I'm talking about? Like you go to therapy. Isn't that something? So people go to therapy, and you're talking to your therapist. And what is a normal, of course there are different priests in medieval Europe, but there are different priests nowadays, therapists. But these priests, and it's important to be clear, these are priests. These are, these are people who have been trained in seminary, in college, university, to take a certain perspective and uh, indoctrinate you with it. All right, and the perspective is, your emotions are primary. So what do you do? You go to them and you say, hey, I'm married to so-and-so, but I want to be with so-and-so. They say something like, well, how do you feel about that? How would you feel if you cheated on your spouse? How would that make you feel? Tell me more about how you feel. And actually, now that we're talking about it, let's go back into your childhood feeling. Let's talk about how you feel about your parents. Let's talk about how you feel about this and how you feel about that. Uh, as Autumn was saying the other day, uh, if we were a Christian place and we did a retreat, we, somebody might come out of it and say, God told me that we need to build a zendo. Right? And then we would. We'd give that a, we'd give that a sense of authority. Ah, yes. Well, if God said it, then we should do it. But nowadays, as she said, you, you come out of it and you say, I have a deeply felt sense <laughs> that we should build a zendo. And he says, oh, well, if you have a deeply felt sense, <laughs> we should build a zendo. If somebody said, I, God told me, you say, hmm, that's weird. <laughs> but this, this addiction to emotion as primary is just as filled with blind faith as the God thing. We also believe in individualism. As I mentioned to Blas the other day, I don't believe in individuals. <laughs> and so a lot of what you guys do makes no sense to me. Uh, <laughs> um, and... There's this real sense of, of, well, you have all these I statements, right? <laughs> you have just say I statements. Isn't that one of the things? So I this and I that. Um, and so you end up with this situation where, with individualism and emotional uh, fundamentalism, uh, if you just, and equality, if you just start a sentence with the words, I feel, then everyone has to listen and consider that it's valid. <laughs> Isn't that funny? You just say, I feel anything. And people say, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> so <laughs> this is funny because it's just individualism, I, emotional fundamentalism, feel, and then you have this ability to, to get everyone's attention. And the more you feel it, the more attention you get. <laughs> right? They really, they really can't, they can't help it because they're in this perspective. So this is good and healthy. It's not bad, and you should do it, and it's important, and keep it up. But <laughs> the thing that, that people don't understand, which is very important to see, is that this road never ends. There is no end to your emotional healing. You can deal with your emotional trauma for the next million years 
and you won't be any closer to the end of it. Not any closer. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. You can use it to set the stage for other things. But this isn't a road to truth or to, or to final resolution. It has value. I'm not saying it doesn't have value. I do it. It's important. I feel it's important. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I really do feel it's important. <laughs> so it's not bad. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying it has a limit. It's limited. It doesn't, <laughs> doesn't lead to the end. And the problem with, with thinking that it does is that what I've seen, another problem with what I've seen, is that a lot of the format over the past several days uses our narcissistic tendencies to train people into the shape of liberal humanism. So liberal humanism means that, that you believe that humans are the center of the universe and, the final, and man is the measure of all things, and, which is the normal thing that people believe. And it's liberal, meaning it's, it's about personal emotions. So the whole point of the universe is how individual people feel. And that's how you can make decisions the best way. Follow your heart, right? That's what they say. Follow your heart. So this, in a certain way, trains people into liberal humanism by using our tendency towards narcissism to give us more attention the bigger your emotions are. So I've watched in, in these groups that people who are having subtle emotion don't get attention. Why not? Why don't you pay attention to the people who aren't crying? Instead, the people who are crying or laughing or screaming or whatever, they consistently get attention. And that means that gradually with time, everyone is trained because we want attention. It feels good to have attention to have big emotions and get increasingly, and believe in them with increasing vigor. So this is a real problem. This is a danger. Uh, it's not that you shouldn't have big emotional experiences. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that we shouldn't believe that big emotional experiences are the point of life, or some kind of supreme truth, or should have some kind of ultimate authority. And so we shouldn't set up a social structure in which we use our narcissism as a way to let anyone, to, to reward people for hijacking other people's subtle experience for their gross experience. Gross doesn't mean bad here. This means coarse. No, I don't mean repulsive. I just mean not subtle. Um, <clears throat> so what I've seen here so remember the teaching, remember the story about the Buddha? Remember? He spent decades with what? Sensual indulgence. indulgence, years with asceticism. asceticism, and then he found the middle way. Um, and then after that middle way, he realized here is the, um, the truth. He offered it, and it changed the world again and again. Uh, so what I've seen, this isn't a criticism, right, Bloss? Now, we've discussed this. This is not a criticism. It's actually quite positive. But that was a warning. So, so get ready. <laughs> so what I've seen over the past several days is, is about 50% emotional indulgence. So about 50% of what I saw happening was emotional indulgence, emoting. It was really fun. I went to something similar to this with a Catholic uh, nun, really serious Catholic nun, and, she, and, and, and someone mentioned that it was a spiritual event, and she said, this is not spirituality, this is emoting, and emoting is not spirituality. <laughs> oh, that was so fun. She, she's, about, she's about 80, and she is just... She is, she's the real, the real thing. The love of God is in her veins. So, <clears throat> so, so what I've seen is about 50% emotional indulgence. But I'd say that that's good, actually. 
I think that's a very reasonable percentage for now. I mean, obviously you want to improve on it, but you can only improve on it with increased maturity. You can't just improve on it without increased maturity because I'd say that most of us in this culture, most of you here, uh, have spent decades in emotional mortification, emotional self-mortification, emotional, you could say asceticism, but asceticism in, in a bad way because they're useful forms of asceticism too. I'd say that, that a lot of the time you've been repressing, attempting to destroy uh, your emotions and hurting yourself around your emotions, feeling like you should get rid of them uh, for a long time. And so it makes sense to miss in the other direction for a little while, right? So decades, and okay, you can be emotionally indulgent for years if you need to. Of course, it's better. Don't do it any longer than you have to, but it's good, you know? Go for it. Be a little bit indulgent. Let yourself experience these things, not so much because emotional indulgence is good, but because it at least shakes things up. Okay, good. So then about 40% of what I've seen is, is inculcation of modern assumptions. Uh, the assumptions that I already went over. Uh, but again, that's good. Because obviously traditional Buddhism hasn't been working here. And so we need something that actually engages the culture. Right? So it's essential that, that we come up with something like circling as a way of training right speech because it engages these assumptions. And if you engage them, then you can shift them. You can move them. You, can, you, you have traction. Uh, you can do something. The, the word actually is a really good word is yoga, which, um, which originally 3,000 years ago was not a good word. It, means, it actually means bondage. It means a bond. Uh, and it, it's the thing that you use, of course, as many of you know, to attach an animal to a cart so that the cart will move. But in that way, you're enslaving the animal. So it's a yoke. Yo, yoga is, comes from the same root as the English word yoke. So it, it, it means that. But, and so that's bad, you could say. But 2,000 years ago, after 1,000 years of, of shifting the meaning of the word, it became a good thing. A very good thing, actually, because by, by attaching things and holding them together, you can, you can use the living thing to move the dead thing. And so we can use this practice, I think, to shift our culture, but only by engaging it. So it's, again, not bad that it's 40% inculcation of modern assumptions. Um, we just don't want to have it be more than it has to be. Okay, very good. So we're left with 10%. And I'd say that about 4%, something like 4% of what I've seen is the has been the practice of right speech. <laughs> you know, so that's pretty good. About 3% has been uh, the practice of right thought. For example, when we're talking about what, what is the mind that holds? You know, what is the mind that holds the experience? And what, what are its intentions to transform the experience? Um, so that's really good. It's about 2% right action. In the, in the movement, and also in cooperation. I've seen people work well cleaning up and such. Um, and about 1% right view, meaning that people are really trying to explore how should we look at things. Uh, of course, people have been talking a lot about how should we look at things, but I'm just saying most of that wasn't right view. Only 1% <laughs> was right view. <laughs> so, uh, so that's good news because if 10% of this was actually good, I mean, a lot of good has come this week. It could be 10 times more. That's amazing. I've been amazed at how productive it's been and how helpful it's been, how, um, how, uh, how powerful it's been. Uh, how people have really been allowed to stay with their experience until they discover how they are interpreting it and how that act, the activity of interpreting it is changing it and how you can change that, which changes your life. Um, just as one example, is I've seen many shifts. Uh, I mean, just to give one, the fact that this 
retreat resulted in Lauren asking a real question today? That's a very good sign that this, uh, that this practice works. Because there are plenty of meditation retreats where no one asks a real question, even once. And despite the fact that, and I'd say that, that just that, that period, just that short time made this whole, if that was the only good thing that happened, it was all worth it. Uh, and it wasn't the only good thing that happened. <laughs> a lot of good things happened. I just suggest that 10 times more could happen. Imagine, you're running at 10% of your potential. I mean, that's amazing. That's a really good sign. Because there's, there's an enormous amount that can be done with this, I think. Even if we have a ways to go. So to talk about Lauren again, even though she was the only person in the room really asking that question, and even though she was only asking it for five or ten minutes, ten maybe, probably not ten, five or ten minutes, and even though um, very few, maybe only one other person in the room even understood the question, and even though the vultures gathered about her uh, to prevent her from asking the question further, uh, <coughs> Despite all that, it was very good. It was very good. Uh, it's important to understand that there is no way to understand that question. If you remember what the question was, you didn't hear it. It isn't just that there's no way to understand the question. There's no way to understand how to approach the question. It's pure hopeless helplessness. There's no way to deal with it, and it must be dealt with today. It must be completely resolved today. Otherwise, you've thrown away your life and everyone else's permanently. That's the reality of it. It's like that. It's, it's completely incomprehensible. It's a level of question that will destroy your life. If you stay with it, you will definitely achieve awakening. And with that realization of awakening comes a true knowledge. <coughs> a true knowledge that isn't just someone's opinion. Because opinions could never answer that question. Opinions are completely irrelevant to that question. Doesn't matter how you see it. Doesn't matter how someone else sees it. It's a real question and it has a real answer. That answer is worth giving our lives for. Giving up everything we've gained, everything we've ever understood, everything we are. To give up all of that for that question is worth it, much less the answer. If we find that answer, then we become one of these people who can correctly teach the path. Because in fact, whatever equality says, there are people who know better than other people. There just are people who know better than other people. And in fact, there are people who know better than you about your experience. There are people who can see your experience more clearly than you can, who can disagree with you about what you're feeling and be right, and you're wrong. And this isn't even one of the profound capacities of such people. There is such a thing as, teach, as a teacher, and it's good to have a teacher. Because the purpose of this path is to do what is, what must be done. And what must be done is that we are capable of being simultaneously authentic and kind. The purpose of this path is to be, become capable of truly seeing and truly loving in one moment. To achieve that is the great challenge of life and is the task that must be done. So I'd ask you <clears throat> to please make use of this opportunity. You still have time in this retreat. You still have time to gain the skills needed in order to ask such questions truly. 
You don't have time to find true connection, be corrected, offer corrections, not by saying you should be this way and I should be that way, but through the true practice of right speech. You still have time to learn to say what you have to say. This is your opportunity now, the opportunity to, to actually become capable of saying what you have to say, because it has to be said. It must be said. There's not time left to wait to say what you have to say. You have the opportunity to learn how to hear what you have to hear. Again, there's not time to wait anymore to hear what you must hear. It's time to hear it now, today. Not tomorrow, not next week. And how is that done? It's done in community. It's done in connection. It's done in relationship. In community, we change ourselves. In relationship, we change ourselves. In community, we change the world. In community, we serve all beings. That's how it's done. That's the reality. That's the truth. Whether we like it or not, whether we believe it or not. It's how it is. That's just how it is. And you have a chance right now. You've been given this chance. You've earned this chance. You put yourself in the position to take this chance to make these transformations in community. Please. Please understand, your life is incomprehensibly precious. This is your life. This is your life. Get out of delusion and see this is your life. This now, this is your life, not later. You have the chance to realize what that is. You have this chance. How many people have this chance right now? are in such a circumstance as you are to realize what your life really is, what your vow really is, what your purpose really is. What is your true life? What is that? That's truly authentic, that's truly kind, that can truly see and truly love everyone. What is that? You have the chance to realize that. And if you realize that, <clears throat> then you can realize that which isn't life, that which isn't subject to life or death. You have the chance to completely answer Lauren's question so that it can be used for the benefit of all living things.